nuclear waste. It's dangerous for centuries. It needs to go away. And now, it will. One, two, three. Shoot! One, two, three. What am I doing wrong? One, two, three. Boy, if only it were that easy. Now, the persistent paradox that is nuclear power. It's efficient. One train car full of nuclear fuel can keep a nuclear power plant running for a year. But it takes a whole train load of coal every day to keep a conventional power plant running. There are a lot of things to be afraid of when it comes to nuclear power. There are meltdowns where the uranium metal fuel gets so hot that it burns a hole through the reactor and the whole thing explodes. There are terrorists who could get hold of some of this nuclear material and make the events of September 11th look like getting a parking ticket. The real terror, the real danger, the real horror of nuclear power may come long after the power is generated with nuclear waste. Now, do science and society have an answer for this problem? Well, let's have a look. 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 He went from science sweetheart to nuclear skid row. Hear about his rise, fall, and valiant climb back on The Nine True Science Story. After World War II, America found a new hero, a hero whose name would be known around the world, our friend, the Atom. I was young and cocky. You know how it is. When, when you're young, you think you can do anything. Indeed, his future seemed limitless. That stuff was made up by the press and my promoters. I never said I could do all that stuff. The 60s generation turned against Mr. Adam. All of a sudden, I'm not the friend anymore. You know? All of a sudden, I'm not cool. That really messed me up. There's not a day goes by that I don't wish I could go back and change all those errors. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. We, can we stop? I, I need a break. Just, just a sec. It was rough. I thought I was all bad. There's been some mistakes in the past, but I'm not ready to pull the plug just yet. America still needs me, and I'm going to find a way to be our friend, the Atom, again. This is the Columbia Generating Station, the only nuclear power plant in the Pacific Northwest, but there are 103 nuclear power plants in the United States operating today. The big tall building's the reactor, the big lower building is the generator, and the round buildings near us are the cooling towers to keep the steam going through the electrical generating cycle. At a nuclear power plant, everybody who comes in gets checked out by guys like these. It's a pretty secure place. Under here is the reactor. 30 meters down, when the reactor's running, there's uranium fuel making heat. This is a classic demonstration of a nuclear chain reaction, the kind of reaction we have in a nuclear reactor. The mouse traps represent uranium atoms that we get by digging up ore from the ground, and the ping pong balls represent the subatomic particles called neutrons. Now, to start a chain reaction, we bombard the uranium atoms with extra neutrons, or in this case, an extra neutron. The reason this nuclear chain reaction is possible is because uranium has the rare ability to absorb a neutron, which will make it split or fission into smaller fragments. As uranium splits, it releases a lot of energy in the form of heat. 
It also spits out a neutron of its own, which can bombard a neighboring uranium atom, which then itself fissions, releasing heat and zinging out another neutron, and so on and so on. In the reactor, the heat created by fissioning uranium heats up water, making steam. This high-pressure steam blows on the propeller blades of a turbine, which spins the shaft of a huge generator. Now, in the generator, a coil of wire is spinning in a magnetic field, which makes electricity. So it all boils down to this. Uh, the reactor, the steam, the turbine, the fuel, everything is set up to drive this big generator. It turns 30 times a second and makes electricity for close to 3 million people. It makes 1.2 gigawatts. It's a lot of juice. A nuclear power plant can generate a lot of electricity, but in nature, we don't get something for nothing. So when we generate electricity, we also get tons of radioactive waste. How much waste do you make in, in 60 years? Well, in 60 years, we would produce enough waste to basically fit contained into a convenience store. That's so, not very much. Well, it's not very much when you compare it to like a coal plant where you know, it's waste of all the coal that it uses and emissions into the environment. It's probably uh, 10 million times that. Yeah. yeah. So the stuff is dangerous. It's dangerous, but it's contained in a small volume. The fuel rods are taken from there into this pool. This is where they're stored for years. When they first come out, they're too hot to handle. They cool off, and then they're eventually taken to dry storage. And there are reactor pools like this all over the world, just waiting for a place to put the waste. What is this, Larry? This is a dry cask storage for spent nuclear fuel. Is this radioactive? Uh, there's radioactivity inside it. Um, we've got uh, concrete overpack that protects us from the radiation. How thick is that? Oh, it's about 22 inches. A uh, total about 24 inches, including the steel. You can just stand right next to these. You can touch these. Oh, yeah. You, uh, it's completely safe. And uh, you can see by looking at the, the meter, it's less than one millirem per hour on contact. Barely a millirem per hour. Put that in perspective. What's a, uh, what's a dental x-ray? Dental x-ray is probably about 20 millirems. So right up next to it, it's less than an x-ray, which is only on for a few moments. Yes. Right. Suppose we just left it here. How many years or centuries would it take for this stuff to be benign? The current average estimate is about 10,000 years. 10,000 years? Yes. That's a long time. Yes, it is. And there's something about these that doesn't look like they're good for 5,000 years. No, they're not. Yeah. Radiation is technically any energy that radiates. So light, heat, microwaves, and radio waves are all radiant energy. Now, this type of energy is often easy to contain. Microwaves can be contained with nothing more than a metal screen. Light can be blocked with nothing more than a piece of paper. The more paper you have, the more blocking you get. Now, in nuclear reactions, our problem is what we call ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation can smash into the tissues of living things and disrupt our cells. A high dose can kill you in a few seconds, or a few minutes, or a few days. Lower doses can disrupt your DNA and make you sick. That's how it causes cancer. So we need to keep people and things from getting irradiated in the first place. And pieces of paper aren't going to do it. Scientists in the nuclear industry often use concrete and stainless steel built up in layers as much as three meters or 10 feet thick. See, with enough shielding, you can contain even nuclear radiation. You see, in this game, rock beats paper. The first United States nuclear power plant began commercial operation in 1957. Wow, that is neat, Mr. Sanders. And we'll build more reactors because they're clean and completely safe. My father says spent fuel from reactors is radioactive for thousands of years and is dangerous. Don't worry, Mary. The scientists in the future will fix everything. Mr. Sanders, can't nuclear power plants have meltdowns and kill people? That sounds like a lie that the communists made up, Tommy. But my father told me that too, Mr. Sanders. What's his name? I'd like to write it down in my little book. I'm going to tell my father what you're doing, Mr. Sanders. Is nuclear power really that dangerous, Mr. Sanders? Oh, yes, Tommy. I just didn't want to admit it to that know-it-all Mary. Wh 
if you had your way, what would you do with the waste? I'd put the waste in Yucca Mountain. Now, why do you like Yucca Mountain? Well, it's the best uh, method preferred to date for dealing with uh, spent fuel storage. Did you think there'll ever be a better method? Uh, you never know what some engineer is gonna, gonna think up down the road, so I can't say it's the best. Look out there. Looks like we're in the middle of nowhere. And in a sense, we are. We're out here near uh, Yucca Mountain, where we're gonna store nuclear waste. But it's only 100 miles from there to Las Vegas. That's not very far at all, especially if you have to keep that waste away from people for 10,000 years. Well, we're on Yucca Mountain Crest, about 5,000 feet above sea level. The repository would be almost directly beneath us. How far? About 1,000 feet down to the repository, about another 1,000 feet beneath that to the water table. Why Yucca Mountain? Why here? I think the top reasons are it's a very dry site. We don't get much rain out here at all. It's a very remote location. It's many miles away from many population centers. And a third reason I would say because of the rock. Because the rocks themselves are very stable and there's a large enough block of rock to be able to accommodate the nuclear waste. In 1987, Yucca Mountain was chosen as the best site to evaluate for a long-term national nuclear fuel repository. Using this specially developed boring rig, a system of tunnels known as the Exploratory Studies Facility, or ESF, was created inside the mountain to allow scientists to examine and test the rocks. This is volcanic tuff, and it's the material that was ejected from a volcano. You want the rock to be strong and stable and to be able to support the tunnels and drifts into which people and the waste would have to go. But what if it gets wet? That's the thing, right? Well, that is the big question, Bill, and that's a lot of the studies that we're doing out here are looking at how does water move through the mountain? How much water is there? How could it come in contact with the waste? But remember, Yucca Mountain is in the Mojave Desert. We only get between four and six inches of rain a year here. It's an extremely dry environment. We've got one of the deepest water tables in North America here. If you don't have water, there's really no other mechanism for the radionuclides to come in contact with the public. How many miles of tunnel would there be ultimately? The, the amount of tunnel we would need to emplace 70,000 metric tons is approximately 65 miles of tunnel. And how many do you have so far? Right now we just have these two, and these are not part of the repository. These are part of the exploratory studies. Uh, they would not be used for emplacement. Do you think this facility will do the job storing 70,000 metric tons? I believe it will. I, and, uh, being a researcher, I have confidence in science and, and uh, engineering. And uh, 10,000 years. 10,000 years. Rain, shine, earthquakes, we're good. Uh, as a scientist, I believe it's good, but I make no guarantees. It's going to be very hard indeed to build a structure that's earthquake proof, leak proof, and erosion proof that lasts at least 10,000 years. It's never been done. Consider the pyramids. They're some of the longest lasting civil engineered structures on Earth, but every single one of them has been broken into. And the vandals and archaeologists who got in were not deterred in any way by big, heavy stone walls or spooky curses. Maybe they just couldn't read the hieroglyphic warning. Now, the pyramids were built by thousands of Egyptians working together. And the structures have lasted a long, long time. But they did not protect the valuables inside. What makes us think that we can? So is Yucca Mountain a good idea? Yucca, I'm worried, is going to be one of the worst environmental uh, mistakes that our species has ever made. The primary scientific arguments for Yucca Mountain were that it was very dry and that the geologic formation was such that moisture would not penetrate into the mountain, get into the radioactive waste and migrate for hundreds of thousands of years. But that argument went completely out the window when the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, dug out a little cavern within Yucca Mountain and put in sensitive equipment to find out if there was moisture. After six months, it turns out they lost all their data because there was so much moisture in the cavern that shorted out all the electrical equipment. So they changed the rules. They changed the rules so that you could now in your model rely upon the canister in which the waste was put. And even that doesn't get them very far because no one has built any 
canister that's lasted 10,000 years. And 10,000 years, which is the period they say it's going to de degrade in, almost all of the plutonium is still left. So where did 10,000 years come from? It's completely arbitrary. The Department of Energy's models were showing that the peak exposure was at 300,000 years and that they couldn't meet the standard. So at that point, the Department of Energy had estimated that the canisters didn't start to degrade until 11,000 years. So they said, why don't we have to comply with the rules only for the first 10,000? Plutonium is the most dangerous thing that human beings have ever made. It will probably be our demise. A millionth of an ounce, the size of a speck of dust, if inhaled, will cause lung cancer. A few pounds the size of a grapefruit that you can hold in your hand will bring down a city if used in a nuclear weapon. And it has a 24,000 year half-life. We measure radioactivity in what's called half-lives. You see, the atoms in radioactive material spontaneously just break apart or decay. Now, we can't tell when an individual atom will decay, but we can tell when a fraction of them will. So a half-life is the amount of time it takes for half the atoms in a piece of radioactive material to break apart. Now, plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. So let's say this red water is the plutonium in a spent nuclear fuel rod fresh from the reactor. Well, after one half-life, 24,000 years, diluting this water by half, it looks like this. After two half-lives, 48,000 years, it would look like this. After 10 half-lives, 240,000 years, the water starts to look pretty clear. Now, plutonium is notorious. It's especially radioactive. It's 20 million times more radioactive than uranium dug from a mine. You see, we're not talking about potato salad left out in the sun. We're talking about plutonium. Now, the legal requirement for storing this material is only 10,000 years. That would be over here someplace. That's not even half of a half-life. So what should we do with all this waste that we have right now? So what we're about to do, I think, is amongst the worst things that we can do, which is to move be ahead with a project that we know technologically can't contain the waste. So what we should do, and most independent experts believe this is what we should do, is that the high-level waste should remain at the site of generation, the reactors, for 50 to 100 years. It needs to cool off anyway before you can handle it uh, more safely. And during that time, intensive research to come up with a better way of dealing with it than just digging a hole in the ground and putting it there. It's hard to conceive of um, a technology more dangerous and a species less capable of handling that danger. Good evening. My guest is Congressman Peter Newton, and the topic is nuclear energy. Congressman, what about the fact that reactor-grade plutonium could be used by terrorists to make weapons? Well, that's bad. So I would have to say I am against nuclear energy. But you could also argue that in over 50 years of using nuclear energy in the U.S., no one has ever been killed in a nuclear power accident. That is good. Count me in on that. And then there's the enormous cost of disposing of nuclear waste. We cannot afford that. Nuclear power has got to go. But, but, but if it does go, we'd lose the source of 20% of our electricity here in the U.S. Exactly. There is no way I'm going to tell the good people who elected me to use 20% less electricity. Read my lips. We need nuclear energy. Period. Let's try this. Gum tastes good. I have always stood up for gum. They will never take gum away. Three hundred thousand tons and growing. Scientists have spent nearly 60 years and billions of dollars researching and testing, looking for a solution to this problem. They've come up with some pretty interesting ideas, like burying waste under the ocean floor, dropping it into a hole in the Earth's crust, tunneling under remote islands and leaving it there, or stashing it in the polar ice caps. 
So far, all these plans prove to be unmanageable, too expensive, or just too dangerous. But what about shooting the waste into outer space? We would be rid of it forever, and it could just fall into the sun or maybe expand with the universe. Why don't we just take this nuclear waste and shoot it into space on a rocket? If you look at, at the space shuttle program, which is one of the safest programs in space travel we've ever put together, we've had two accidents in, what, 200 missions? You're looking at one in 100. The average payload on the space shuttle is a few tons. We're talking about sending 70,000 tons of material up. You're going to have an accident. Imagine, you know the fervor that's going on now. We're talking about moving this material across country and posing of it deep underground in our own country. Imagine the fervor if a few tons of this material was dispersed in a fine powder in the upper atmosphere all around the world. Be a problem. And oh, it would be a mess. That's really the main reason, and not to mention the cost. Now, what is this business of transmuting? Basically, the, the common adage or, or the, the age-old dream of turning lead into gold. We take something that has a negative value and turn it into something that'll go away, that'll either decay away within 30 years or 100 years or, or turn it into something stable. Let's say this is the arrangement of fuel rods in a nuclear reactor. To get rid of nuclear waste, it's been proposed that we build a different type of reactor where the reaction is more spread out using fewer fuel rods or less concentrated ones. Now, this reactor wouldn't sustain its chain reaction. But if we could blast it with a powerful enough beam of neutrons, we could get these elements to change or transmute into lighter, shorter half-life, less radioactive elements within a few hundred years. If this works, it would be possible to transmute our high-level waste into low-level waste. And then we could bury it safely within a century or so. Right now, when you look at a Yucca Mountain or any other repository in the world, you're dealing with managing elements for hundreds of thousands of years beyond the scope of, of human knowledge. If we can get that number down to a thousand years, we can look at examples. You look at the pyramids, look at the ziggurats. We can see concrete examples of human engineering that's lasted for thousands of years. The question is, do we spend money now to reduce a potential problem in the future? Or do we feel that potential problem in the future is small enough that it is not worth spending resources now? You're talking about taking money from researching cancer cures, You're talking about taking money from schools or your tax refund, and putting it towards getting rid of a problem that some people don't think is a large problem. Nuclear power offered great promise. It was created by geniuses, but there are no genius trash collectors picking up after them. Right now, the nuclear waste problem has no solution. Yucca Mountain is fraught with difficulties. The state of Nevada is doing all it can to stop it. See, nuclear waste has been sitting out there all over the world for decades. But remember, we're talking about plutonium and very concentrated uranium. This stuff is deadly on a scale that's hard to imagine. You have to wonder, has anyone really stopped to think what 10,000 or 30,000 or 300,000 years really means? No civilization in history has lasted a tenth of the half-life of this material. Now, until the waste problem is solved, for real, nuclear power doesn't do us any good. Future generations, 100 or 200 years from now, our descendants are going to be furious with us. So solve the waste problem or shut the reactors down. Now, you're a voter or a taxpayer. Make them get it done. That's the way I see it. And I'll see you next time on The Eyes of Nye. We've covered a lot of ground, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. Check out eyesofnye.org for more cool science.